today we're recognizing Holocaust Remembrance Day, or as it's known usually in Jewish communities, Yom HaShoah. In Hebrew, Shoah is the word for catastrophe. The day is set for this time of year because on, on April 19, 1943, the Jewish community in the Warsaw Ghetto rose up against their captors. They organized to fight back and regain their freedom. For the first portion of this sermon, I want to share some information about the Holocaust. Often, we're so overwhelmed by the horror that it's difficult to absorb information about what happened. If we can keep our eyes and ears, our hearts and minds open, there's a lot to learn from how things unfolded. The Holocaust era began in January 1933 when Hitler and the Nazi party came to power in Germany. It ended in 1945 when Allied powers defeated Nazi Germany. The level of destruction that occurred in a span of just 12 years is astounding. <laughs> When they came to power in Germany, Nazis didn't immediately start carrying out mass murders. They began using the government to target and exclude Jewish communities from German society. This past summer, I had the opportunity to visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. It's quite an experience. There is a lot to learn and to feel. For me, this was one of the most important pieces of learning. I remember this room vividly. It explained how the killings didn't arise from nowhere. There were years building up to that psychological preparation for people to either participate or turn a blind eye to what was going on. Two years after taking power, Nazis passed the Nuremberg Race Laws of 1935 that attempted to define Jews as a race. Anyone who had three Jewish grandparents was deemed Jewish too. It was very specific. And under the new law, Jews in Germany were no longer citizens but subjects of the state. These years also brought a range of other tactics of propaganda, boycotting Jewish businesses, public humiliation, obligatory markings like armbands or stars. These all paved the way for other forms of violence. These years also included physical displacement of Jewish people, resettlement, expulsion, deportation, ghettoization, and this progressed into internment for Jews in overcrowded ghettos, concentration camps, and forced labor camps. This process paved the way for the theft and plunder of all of the property that was left behind. Now, a lot of Jews died as a result of this violence, but the systematic murder didn't begin until 1941. In 1941, Nazi leaders decided to implement the final solution to the Jewish question, an all-out genocide. That's eight years after they came into power. Nazis targeted Jews because, as we know, they were ra rabidly anti-Semitic. They accused Jews of causing Germany's social, economic, political, and cultural problems. But it's important to remember that the Nazis didn't invent anti-Semitism, and it didn't end there. Jewish people had been accused and persecuted in Europe dating back to ancient times. In the Middle Ages, the prejudice was rooted in early Christian belief that Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. This is one of my interesting eye-opening learnings this week. Um, as Europe became more secular over time, a lot of places lifted most of the restrictions on Jews and that prejudice started to decline. But that didn't mean anti-Semitism dried up and went away. 
In the 18th and 19th centuries, the prejudice shifted from a religious-based anti-Semitism to something more akin to nationalism or racial prejudice, as theories of eugenics and race and social Darwinism played into a whole new kind of prejudice and anti-Semitism. Throughout the 1930s, Nazi Germany pushed forward. By 1942, as a result of annexation, invasion, occupation, and alliances, Nazi Germany controlled most of Europe and parts of North Africa. And that expansion brought millions more Jewish people under German control. Though many Jews were killed before the final solution began, the vast majority of Jewish victims were murdered during this four-year period of 1941 to 1945. There were two main methods. One was mass shootings outside of villages and towns. The other was asphyxiation by poison gas. In late 1941, Nazis began building special killing centers in German-occupied Poland. They built five of these centers. German authorities, with the help of their allies and collaborators, transported Jews from all over Europe to these centers. And they disguised that transportation by calling it a resettlement action or evacuation transports. For efficiency, they used all of the European railway system that was so much more developed than here. At all five of these centers, German officials forced some Jewish prisoners to assist in the killing process. These prisoners had to sort through the victims' belongings and remove victims' bodies from gas chambers. Nearly 2.7 million Jewish men, women, and children were murdered in these five locations. When I visited the Holocaust Memorial and Museum, this was the other key eye-opening learning, that the scale of the murder was so vast that it took significant engineering to plan and kill and dispose of that many people as quickly as possible. The barrier wasn't interference from anyone trying to stop them. The real challenge for Nazis in this phase was how efficiently their transportation, killing, and disposal could run. Hitler didn't act alone. We know that he had help from major other Nazis. But in addition, countless soldiers, policemen, civil servants, lawyers, judges, business people, engineers, doctors, and nurses chose to implement the policies as well. Most often, individuals contributed to the Holocaust through inaction or indifference. The Holocaust ended in May of 1945, when Allied powers defeated Nazi Germany in World War II. As Allied forces moved across Europe, they overran concentration camps and liberated surviving prisoners. Unfortunately, liberation didn't necessarily equate to closure. Those scattered individual Jews who survived had often lost entire families or communities. Some were able to go home. Some chose to rebuild their lives in Europe. Some found themselves living in displaced persons camps. Survivors and second generation Jews often lived with packed bags ready to flee their homes at a moment's notice. Not because of natural disaster as we might experience here in California, but out of the fear that they might be persecuted again one day. This is a deep, deep level of fear that's impossible to wrap our heads around if we haven't been there. Jewish people have faced this tremendous challenge of navigating grief in a way that both 
honors the past and keeps open the possibility of a future thriving, peaceful, and finding a renewal of faith in the midst of all of that loss. There are today actively anti-Semitic people who aim to deny the Holocaust. It's also important that we acknowledge that even for us who embrace facts and history, it takes a great deal of emotional work to glimpse at the depth of evil that was perpetrated in very recent history. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. It should be uncomfortable, almost impossible to wrap our heads around. Looking at the killing machine makes us question so much about what we believe about humanity and about God. That discomfort is part of what makes it too easy sometimes to ignore what actually happened. Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah, can't be simply pointing fingers at the Nazis as saying that was terrible, I'm glad that chapter's over. To honor lives lost, to honor a tragedy, we're called to build a world where that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. As I was researching this week, I was reminded that other genocides have happened that we're aware of in fairly recent history. We're aware of the extermination of Armenians by the Turks. More recently, killings in Cambodia in the 1970s. In 1994, there were mass killings in Rwanda where Hutus massacred Tutsi people. The country's still recovering. And in Darfur, the killings began in 2003. In none of these cases were international resources brought to bear to stop the killing. In none of those cases were international resources brought to bear to stop the killings. Fortunately, in the 90s, we had a different picture and a different story in the former Yugoslavia and what we were able to prevent together there. I bring all this up because it can happen other places. That's the brilliance of our Time for All Ages story. The story speaks vaguely about terrible things coming and taking away different types of animals. All the while, Little Rabbit knew something was wrong. He knew in his gut that they should speak up or fight back. But he wasn't able to mobilize anyone until it was too late. Now, the, the vagueness of that allegory makes it a little more approachable for children. It also reminds us that it's not limited to a particular time or place or culture. The story ends with this little glimmer of hope. Little Rabbit leaves his decimated area to travel to another community, to find a new home, to share his hard-won wisdom with the creatures there. Speak up when the terrible things come for the marginalized. Sooner or later, they will be coming for you too, so speak up and fight back while we can. I couldn't finish this sermon without sharing a concern from my German friend, Rika. You may remember Reverend Rika preached here once, maybe twice. It drives her up the wall when Americans make unthoughtful jump of comparison, comparing anything that's oppressive or dehumanizing and immediately jumping to Nazis and Hitler. That type of exaggeration is used both from the right and the left to dramatize the other. Rika helped me see why this line of argument is so problematic. First, it minimizes a uniquely 
horrifying moment of the Holocaust. We may not like what our political adversary is doing, but comparing that to the murder of six million Jews and trying to take over a continent is a little much. It diminishes the gravity of a historical event. Second, pointing to Hitler and the Nazis for comparison ignores our own history of genocide, race-based evil, and suppression of information here. We don't have to point to Europe. We had McCarthyism. We had hundreds of years of slavery here in America. The genocide of American Indians happened here. Pointing over there to the Nazis and Hitler makes our human capacity for evil seem like a faraway boogeyman that couldn't happen here. And third, Comparing our adversaries with Hitler distorts the real history of Americans' engagement with World War II. We never talk about the fact that Jews were prevented from immigrating to the United States during that time. Boats full of Jewish people were refused entry here. During the same war, the United States rounded up Japanese Americans, not Japanese citizens, but Japanese Americans, and sent them to internment camps. Their business and property were also left to plunder. After the war, African American GIs were denied economic and housing benefits that were given to their white counterparts, effectively barring another generation of the black community from access to the American dream. I'm not saying all these things to be anti-American. I'm saying these things because history matters and context matters. There are invaluable lessons in what we humans have perpetrated and what we have survived. Denying that history, ignoring it, keeping it from younger generations is a dangerous exercise in ignorance. It's dangerous for all of us. History is particularly important to the survivors. One of our most basic human needs is to be seen and heard. To have our experience, our very existence, acknowledged by other people. History also lets us know that we're not alone. For me, learning about my courageous queer predecessors has meant the world. Knowing some of their struggles, the risks they took, the calculated strategies, the courage, the faith, the sense of love, all of that journey of my community has fueled my sense of development and pride. And all of that history I had to dig for, especially 20 years ago. The thought that someone would actively keep it from young queer people is infuriating. The same is true for access to ethnic studies, classes or books, or for young people hearing the history of their faith community, and young women grappling with the fact that their full participation in American society was gained in the last hundred years. Bearing witness to the truth of those struggles both historic and current, is a critically important way of supporting marginalized people. The least we can do is continue to listen when the truth makes us uncomfortable. Attempting to erase a community through violence or any other tactic should frighten us all. One of the ways we push back is to listen and to learn as much as we can. Amen.